So what you're looking at right here in this picture is something called the Monteverde golden toad. This is a toad that's endemic to Costa Rica. Endemic meaning it can't be found anywhere else in the world except for these mountains in Costa Rica. Um, in this picture here, what you're looking at is a bunch of males. So this picture was taken by this woman named Marty Crump who wanted to do research on these frogs. So she went out to a field site up in the mountains um, and found a bunch of males congregated around a pond. And what's interesting about these frogs is they basically stay underground year round until the rainy season comes. And when the rainy season comes, they all pop out and wait for females to show up to breed in these sort of ephemeral ponds that only stick around for a little bit during the rainy season. So what you're looking at right here in this picture is sort of the, the frog equivalent to a fraternity party where all these gold toads are the male toads waiting for a female to show up. And when a female shows up, this is what it looks like. So that white thing that you see in the middle, that's the female toad. And all the male toads are basically competing to breed with her. The way that frogs breed is they have external fertilization, meaning that one male has to grab onto her back and then she'll lay her eggs and he'll lay his sperm on top of that to fertilize the eggs. So all these guys are competing for the opportunity to breed with her. And I don't even know what this guy down here at the bottom is trying to accomplish, but the idea here is that they're all trying to get the opportunity to breed. So that Marty Crump lady who was out there um, looking for these frogs was super satisfied. She had, was setting up her field season to do research on these frogs and there were tons of frogs that were out there. She was like, great, tons of frogs. I'm gonna come back next year and start doing research on these guys. So she came back the next year and she only found one frog at that same spot. And then she started going to like 20, 30 different ponds all over the place in Monteverde, Costa Rica. And she only found this one frog at that one site. She said, maybe it's an off year. So she came back the next year and there were no golden toads there. This was back in the eighties. No golden toads have been seen there since and they're now considered extinct. And what's interesting is it's not just the golden toad that disappeared from this cloud forest reserve in Monteverde. So this protected forest in Monteverde, Costa Rica. It wasn't just the golden toad that disappeared but a whole suite of frogs that disappeared from the Monteverde Cloud Forest Preserve too. So we saw a bunch of different species that also disappeared back in the 80s. So this was really weird to Marty and she sort of went back to her conferences. There's big groups of frog scientists that all get together every year and talk about their frog research. So she went back to the sort of frog conference that happens every year. And she said, hey, all of these frogs disappeared from the Cloud Forest Preserve. What the heck is going on with that? And other people started talking and saying, you know what, I'm seeing the same thing. And when they started sort of putting the pieces together, they figured out like this is not something that's happening just in Monteverde in Costa Rica. So this red dot that you see right here where the red dots represent multi-species declines, but it's something that's happening everywhere. So they're seeing multi-species multi declines in California and Brazil and Australia and also individual species. Those are people that were doing research were seeing populations of those individual species disappearing too. So they ended up in 2004 doing this thing called the Global Amphibian Assessment. And this is the results of that Global Amphibian Assessment. So what you're looking at here are basically three colors. You've got your greens, your blues, and your reds. And the darker those colors get, it means the more species of frogs or amphibians that were lost from, a, from those different causes associated with those colors where the greens are associated with habitat loss. So, you know, not surprisingly in Europe where there's been a lot of habitat destruction in cities and things like that in agriculture, a lot of amphibian species have been lost because of habitat loss. And then you've got Southeast Asia where you've got a lot of species that have been lost for overexploitation, where they're using those frogs for different things like to eat. And then you've also got these things like we see in Costa Rica, in Australia, and in California where you have these things that are enigmatic declines, where it's not habitat loss, it's not overexploitation, it's not obvious causes, it's weird things where you have these really preserved pristine habitats that are disappearing. And that's actually been linked to this disease called chytridiomycosis, which is a disease that I did my research on, and other things like pollution and introduced species and things that don't really care about whether the habitat's preserved or whether you have a habitat border, they can go across it. But the ultimate outcome of this global amphibian assessment was that over 41% of amphibian species were considered threatened, okay? So when we talk about threatened, there's these three distinct categories that this group that does research on species across the world has that consider a species to be potentially threatened with extinction. So that can mean critically endangered, endangered or vulnerable of that species going completely extinct. So 41% of amphibian species from that research study 
were considered to be threatened with potential extinction um, basically in the next 10 years or so. And so this is something that's actually not unique to amphibians, but this is something that we're seeing across tons of different groups. So birds, mammals, many different species are considered threatened with extinction. Um, and so these surveys are now sort of calling people to arms. And it's even gotten to the point that people are considering this uh, potentially a sixth mass extinction. So if you think about a mass extinction, you can think about the dinosaurs when the asteroids hit the earth uh, several hundred million years ago and wiped out the dinosaurs. That was a mass extinction. Um, so lots of species disappearing in a very, very short period of time. And in fact, in geological history, there have been five major periods since the beginning of the earth um, when there have been these sort of mass extinctions where many, many species have disappeared in a relatively short period of time. And now it's getting to the point now that people are starting to make the argument that we're in the midst of a sixth mass extinction that is largely been being driven from human causes. And so what we're gonna spend our time talking about for the next two or three lectures are this idea of biodiversity and the idea that we're in a sixth mass extinction. But mostly we wanna be talking about what is biodiversity? So what are the threats to biodiversity? So what's causing those threats? And what are the benefits of biodiversity? So why should we care about biodiversity at all? And so this is what we'll be talking about over the next uh, probably two or three lectures. So I'm gonna start with this question of what is biodiversity? So defining biodiversity. So biodiversity can be thought of as basically the tree of life. And so this is just sort of a tree that describes all the evolutionary relationships among different organisms. And the branches on this tree represent different major lineages of organisms. And the tips or the leaves on the tree represent different living taxa. So for example, you can see this red branch right here. This represents vertebrate species on this sort of uh, beautiful depictions of the tree of life. And you can see all the different organisms represent the leaves on this tree. And so you see lots of that diversity. And when biodiversity increases, essentially the tree of life gets richer and fuller, grows more branches, more leaves. When extinctions occur, we can lose leaves. It's like leaves falling off of the tree or potentially entire branches getting lopped off of the tree. So this is one sort of metaphor uh, to think about biodiversity. And within this sort of idea of biodiversity, there's three major types or ways that we can define it. Taxonomic species diversity, genetic diversity, and functional diversity. So I'm gonna define what these three terms are and just give you some very simplified examples. So taxonomic species diversity is basically just the total number of species in, a, in an area. So an example of this might be something called species richness. If you guys remember doing measuring species richness in the Arboretum when you took 140, that's a measure of taxonomic species diversity. It's the total number of species in an area or some abundance weighted measure of diversity. So Shannon diversity would be an example of this if you remember from Bio 140 lab. And so just to sort of make this a little bit more concrete, we could go to maybe site A, and count five different species there, a tree, a robin, a salamander, deer, and a squirrel. And we could say we measure 20 individuals of each of those different species, okay? And so the taxonomic species diversity or species richness at the site would be five. There's one, two, three, four, five species. And the Shannon diversity or this abundance weighted measure, we're just gonna say it's 1.61. I'm not gonna explain to you exactly how that number is determined, which is understand that this number, the higher it gets, the more diversity there's considered to be at a site. And this is based on not just the number of species there, but also the number of individuals and the evenness of individuals at each of those plots. So for example, if we go to site B, where we still have the same one, two, three, four, five species, but at site B, it's really squirrel dominant. There's 80 squirrels there and only five of these other individuals. And so although the species richness or the number stays the same, it's five, the Shannon diversity goes down because it's not as evenly distributed in the numbers of each individual. It's squirrel dominant. So even though there's still one, two, three, four, five species, 
because it's squirrel dominated, the overall diversity or Shannon diversity of the site goes down. So this is an example of taxonomic species diversity. And typically, the greater the species diversity measure, whether it's Shannon diversity or species richness or other measures that we haven't talked about, it indicates a healthier system. So more species, better. Higher diversity, better. If we look at the trends in taxonomic species diversity, um, this figure right here is a semi-accurate representation of the general trends that we see in species diversity in terms of the numbers of species that we've actually named. So this figure is from 2011 and it only represents 93,000 species. This is way less than the number of species that we have named, but it's a good representation of the sort of overall abundance of the named species that we know. So you can see that the pinks represent animalia or animals. So most of the named species that we know are animals. And then you can see fungi, bacteria, plants have pretty uh, diverse groups, but there's not as many named species, okay? And when we actually look at the overall trends in taxonomic diversity that we know about globally, there's currently around 1.8 million named species. Okay, so this is a number I'll actually expect you to remember. Uh, I, I don't always drill down on a lots of details, but I want you guys to have a general idea of how many species we've currently named. And there's estimated to be around 10 million species total. So I want you to just have a general feeling for about how many species we think are out there and about how many we've named at this point. And just to reiterate the sort of trends for the named species that we know out there, this is to go along with the sort of figure that you see over here on the right. The vast majority of named species are actually insects. So insects are a type of animal. I'm sure you guys know what insects are. Um, insects are considered animals and about 50% of the named species that we know are insects. The next biggest group is flowering plants, then other arthropods. So these are like insects, but different. So things like crabs, lobsters, spiders, things like that are arthropods. Mollusks are a pretty big group. So mollusks would be things like clams, snails, things with shells. Um, and then you can see chordates. So we're chordates. These are things with backbones are a pretty small group. And then you've got things like prokaryotes, like bacteria, fungi, protists, which are unicellular eukaryotic organisms. We'll get into all these groups in detail later, but I just want you guys to have a general idea that a lot of these groups are really underrepresented in terms of how much we know about their overall diversity. So another way that we measure, measure diversity is genetic diversity. So we talked about taxonomic species diversity. Now we're gonna talk about this other measure of genetic diversity. And this is just the total genetic information contained with all individuals of a population species or group of species. So one way to think about this is we can think about the species dog. So dogs are Canis lupus subspecies familiaris. So Canis lupus is the species name. And if you think of just one individual dog, we'll call it a Great Dane, your one pet Great Dane, that one individual obviously doesn't capture all the genetic diversity within the species. If we think about dogs as a whole group and all of the different types of dogs and all the different breeds of dogs, there's a ton of, of de genetic diversity within that group. And typically when you're talking about maintaining genetic diversity um, in terms of conservation and maintaining biodiversity, maintaining a higher amount of genetic diversity or greater genetic diversity by maintaining a greater number of individuals and more diverse individuals of the species is good for a population, good for conservation because it can decrease inbreeding. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but just understand at this point now that one form of biodiversity is the genetic diversity and you wanna maintain genetic diversity by maintaining lots of different individuals of the same species. As I'm going along, if things are occurring to you that are not making sense, please feel free to type that into the chat and Claire will try to address things as we go. So if questions come up, please feel free to type stuff into the chat. Um, the last type of diversity that you can measure, so we've talked about taxonomic species diversity, we've talked about genetic diversity. The last type I wanna talk about is functional diversity. Okay, so functional diversity is basically the functional role that a species plays within an ecosystem, okay? So this could be like a pollinator, something that fixes nitrogen into the system, something that photosy photosynthesizes and adds energy to the system. 
So the idea here is what is the role of that species in the system as opposed to the name of that species. So for example, we can think about these 16 different species of bees. So if we think about that original thing, taxonomic species diversity, there's 16 different species of bees here. But when we think about the actual functional diversity that we're looking at within these 16 different species, it may only be, you know, one. Maybe all of these bees play the exact same role in the ecosystem in the sense that they're all pollinating all the same plants. Or maybe they have different roles. Maybe some specialize on just one type of plant, some pollinate a different type of plant, some of them eat plants, some of them are predators. So some of them might have different roles in the ecosystem. So this is functional diversity versus species diversity. Yeah, it's sort of like a niche. It's a little bit different than that, but it's very much like a niche. Yes, exactly. And once again, typically the greater functional diversity that you can maintain, the better it is for, from, from a conservation standpoint. So it's important to note that these types or these three types of biodiversity are not independent of one another. They're all linked to one another, okay? And if you can get an area or a place where you can have a high uh, sort of overlap between taxonomic species, functional species diversity, genetic diversity. So for example, something like Madagascar, where you have a relatively small place. So this is an island off the coast of Africa that you guys have probably heard about from like the, the animated film series or whatever it is, but you know that there's a lot of weird animals there. There's a ton of different species there. They represent a lot of genetic diversity that's unique and different. And they also represent a lot of functional diversity. And so Madagascar is a perfect example of a hot spot where you have lots of species, you have lots of genetic diversity, and you have lots of functional diversity in one place. And from a conservation standpoint, these hot spots are great because it's somewhere where you can get a lot of bang for your buck in the sense that if you can conserve a little patch of habitat in Madagascar, you get sort of hits on all three of these different types of diversity. So this is a conservation strategy. So at this point, you may be asking yourself, okay, Dr. Hyman, that's great. Genetic diversity, wonderful, but why should we care about this at all? Why is this important at all? Um, and so I wanna talk about why you should care about it. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the benefits of biodiversity and why we should care. Um, and some of the different benefits it provides. So different types of ecosystem services, the reasons that conserving biodiversity is important. So ecosystem services, or why we should care about biological diversity. Um, there's essentially four, or I kind of think of them as three major types of ecosystem services that biodiversity provides to us, okay? So one is provisioning services. Um, and these are just things that biodiversity directly provides to us, things that we consume. So things like food, so eating plants, eating animals, things like fuel, things like fiber that we use for our clothes or medicines or other genetic resources, okay? So these are examples of provisioning resources that are really important for the survival of humans. Other important services are things called regulating services or supporting services. So I, I don't really make a huge distinction between these things. So, you know, if on an exam I were to ask you to provide me an example of regulating services versus supporting services, I wouldn't distinguish between these two. But what I want you to understand is these are basically services um, that are not things that humans directly consume but that are necessary for human survival, okay? So we can think about things like pollination. If we don't have pollination of plants, we don't get any of the fruits or foods that we use from plants. Um, these can also be things like soil formation, erosion control, oxygen and CO2 regulation in the atmosphere, water purification, flood control. These are all things that having plants, microorganisms, fungi, if we didn't have those things, we wouldn't get any of this stuff and the habitats that we live in would be entirely uh, inhospitable to human survival. We wouldn't be able to live. There wouldn't be the right amounts of oxygen in the air. There wouldn't be clean water to drink. None of these things would be provided if we didn't have biodiversity. 
out there to provide these regulating and supporting services. Life would be, or Earth would be uninhabitable for humans. And the third one that I wanna talk about is cultural services. Okay, and so this is less about, you know, what's the direct benefit that humans uh, receive from biodiversity or from organisms other than humans. This is more about a quality of life thing, okay? So this sort of aesthetics, the spiritual value, and the mental health that being in natural habitats can provide. And to me, this is a very important resource as well, being able to take a hike, being able to go swimming in a clean ocean is really important for me. And hopefully it is for some of you as well. So I want to pull up this video that sort of exemplifies some of the stuff that I've been talking about just to give you a quick example. Hi, this is Emily from Yes, you're okay. You may have noticed that conservation can be contentious, but no matter how you feel about bees or trees or even fleas, here's one totally practical argument for keeping as many species around as possible. Biodiversity is good for the economy. For example, in a recent study, which I should mention was co-authored by Minute Earth's own writer and tree ecologist, Peter Reich, scientists looked at tons of forests around the world and found that stands with more tree species grow faster and bigger than those with fewer species, which makes sense. Trees of a single species all have the same approaches to getting light, nutrients, and water, so they end up competing with each other while trees of different species have different approaches, so they compete less and together actually use a larger portion of the available resources. And those gains add up to a lot more green. The world's logged forests produce at least 35% more timber than they would if each stand of trees had only one species, to the tune of at least $200 billion in additional revenue each year. This diversity dividend is at least 20 times more than the total amount of money we currently spend on conservation. And economists are finding these diversity dividends in other places too. On farm fields, for instance, different pollinators go to work at different times. So keeping a diverse set of insects around helps ensure that crops will bear fruit and cash whenever they flower. And in our lakes and rivers, the more kinds of toxin munching microbes there are, the more pollutants they can clean up, keeping down the multi-billion dollar cost of maintaining clean waterways. Of course, it's hard to give biodiversity a dollar value in each and every ecosystem. And money probably isn't the only way we want to measure the value of nature. But in lots of places, healthier, more diverse ecosystems appear to translate to a healthier bottom line. So despite what you may have heard, money really does grow on trees. And bees. We're still not sure about bees. Oh, good one. Okay. So let's say you just watched that video and said, uh, that's wonderful, that's all nice, but pony up, where's your proof? Um, so I wanna point out some experimental evidence to back up some of these claims. So this is a study uh, that was conducted by a research group also at the University of Minnesota. And basically they were asking the question, does high species richness and high functional diversity of species increased aspects of ecosystem function, especially this thing called net primary productivity. The net primary productivity is essentially a measure of how productive an ecosystem is. The definition of it is down here. Um, I don't care about you guys so much knowing exactly what net primary productivity is other than to know it's a really concrete way to measure how productive an ecosystem is. So they asked this question and they essentially had the hypothesis that this productivity is gonna increase if you increase species richness and you increase functional diversity of species. So the way they went about doing this study is they set up these experimental plots. So they basically cleared the land and then they started planting different groups of plants um, according to these five functional groups that were made up of 32 different species, okay? So cool grasses, warm season grasses, legumes that fix nitrogen, woodier plants like trees and shrubs in this group called forbs. And so each of these have slightly different functional roles in a plant, uh, in plants or as plants. And they set up experimental plots. So they set up a bunch, so 289 different experimental plots. And these are just three examples of the, what those plots sort of look like. So you might have one species in one functional group. It's just one species of cool grass. 
or you might have two different species of grass, but only representing, of course, one functional group, the cool season grasses. Or you might have six different species present in four different functional groups. So representing one, two, three, four of these different functional groups. And so they made all of these different sort of combinations of species richness and functional richness and measured the net primary productivity. Okay, so a poll question for you guys. That is the correct answer, B. So what we're measuring is the NPP or the net primary productivity within each plot. So that is the dependent variable. The NPP depends on the independent variable. And so our next poll question is, what is the independent variable or what are the independent variables? D is the correct answer. So both the number of species in each plot and the number of functional groups in each plot are the independent variables. So remember in any experimental study, the independent variables are the variables that you manipulate and the dependent variable is the response variable. So it depends on what the status of those independent variables are. So the net primary productivity in this study depends on how many species you have and how many functional groups you have, the independent variables. Any questions about that? Please type them into the chat and we'll try to address them. If you got a question, please feel free to pop it in there. Okay, next poll question. If our hypothesis is that primary productivity increases with increasing species richness, which of the following lines would you predict is going to happen based on that hypothesis? A, B, or C. So on the y-axis, we're looking at net primary productivity. On the x-axis, we're looking at species richness increasing from zero species up to 35 species. So what do we predict is going to happen? And A is the correct answer. So as species richness increases, we're predicting an increase in net primary productivity. What about functional groups? What do we expect as we increase the number of functional groups? What should the response and net primary productivity look like? 86% of you guys said A. And that is the correct answer. So in both cases, we expect an increase in net primary productivity with an increase of species richness, so the number of species, and in the number of functional groups that's added. So this is to basically bolster that argument that increasing biodiversity increases uh, ecosystem function. And so this is what they found. Um, you can see here that once you, as you increase the number of species, the overall plant biomass or plant pro, uh, net primary productivity increases and then sort of plateaus off. And we see the same thing with adding functional groups. So as you add more functional groups, you get an increase in overall plant biomass or net primary productivity. So based on these results, which of the following is true? So in this case, what we're looking at here is an experimental study, okay? So an experimental study is one where the one variable that you're looking at is the variable that's manipulated and everything else across all those other groups is kept the same. So all the other sort of underlying factors are kept the same. So because the only things that we manipulated is the number of species and the number of functional groups and everything else across those experimental plots is the same, we can say that the difference that we see in net primary productivity is caused by species richness and caused by functional groups because those are the only two things that have been manipulated in this experimental study. So this would be different if we had done a non-experimental study, which means a type of study where essentially you just went out to a hundred different forests, you didn't manipulate anything in those forests and you just measured the number of functional groups and species in each forest and then measured the net primary productivity. In that case, there could be other underlying factors because you didn't go in and keep every control for every other single factor. 
So this is the difference between an experimental study versus a non-experimental study and correlation versus causation. So in this case, C was correct. And a uh, way to stick with your guns, uh, the few guys that stuck with it. Um, if this is still not clear to you, please talk to me about it or talk to Claire about it in past sessions. Okay, so I just wanna spend a minute now talking about what all this stuff is actually worth. Um, so this was a study uh, done by Costanza and a group of other sciences, not George Costanza, but a different Costanza. Um, and basically what they looked at is, can we actually quantify the dollar value of all the resources that ecosystems provide to us? And the sort of punchline that they came up with after doing all of these calculations was the average value was $33 trillion per year. And at the time of this study, the gross global national product was around $18 trillion per year. So that is to say that the value of these ecosystem services, things like creating air, creating water, pollination, food creation, all those things were worth twice the global economy or almost twice the global economy on average. So there's huge dollar value to these ecosystem services and many of them are irreplaceable or it would cost way more than this to replace them, to replace all the trees, to create oxygen, to create, uh, to replace all the sort of roots and microorganisms, uh, to filter water and clean water and all the sort of ecosystem services that they provide. So huge dollar value. Um, the other thing that's really important uh, to note is that we shouldn't just think about ecosystems in terms of their dollar value. We also need to think about them in terms of their intrinsic value outside of their value to us and the aesthetic value, the fact that they provide just quality of life and that they're really freaking cool. <laughs> so, I mean, we have things like this jack-o'-lantern fungus. Uh, this is a species of mushroom that grows around here. You could probably find it out in the arboretum if you looked around long enough. This fungus actually glows in the dark. If you take one of those mushrooms, and bring it into the bathroom and close the door and let your eyes adjust, you'll actually see the mushroom glowing. That's why they call it a jack-o'-lantern mushroom. There's other cool fungi like the zombie fungus that can take over an ant's brain and cause it to climb up to a high area where it can distribute its spores better. And all types of these really cool frogs like this uh, gliding frog and glass frog and Pac-Man frog. And these are just a few of the examples of really neat, interesting organisms that are out there that are worth preserving. And the metaphor that's often used for the value of organisms sort of beyond uh, the intrinsic value and beyond the dollar value is this idea that we can think of Earth as an airplane that we're all riding on. And you're a passenger on planet Earth. And you can think of if you guys have ever been on a plane and looked out the window or the outside of a plane, you see like a thousand tiny little bolts on the outside of it. You guys know what I'm talking about? There's all those millions of little bolts that are all over an airplane. You can think of each of those little bolts as an individual species, right? So imagine you're on an airplane, you're at 30,000 feet, and you're looking out the window, and you see one bolt just pop out of the, the, the wing. And you're thinking to yourself, oh man, like that's a little sketchy, uh, but it's probably all right. There's like a million of these bolts. It's probably not a big deal if we lose one of these bolts. And that represents, you know, a species disappearing, a loss of biodiversity, right? But then you see another bolt fly out and another bolt fly out, and another bolt fly out. And at what point do you stand up in the row and start screaming like, this plane's going down, we've lost too many bolts, everything's going loose, it's going crazy, right? And so you can think of those bolts as a species, and at what point do you say like, oh man, we're in trouble, and you need to start screaming about it. So that's a great sort of metaphor to think about. Um, and all this stuff is going on around us as we speak. You know, um, this is an article from last year, and maybe you guys can recall when all these sort of news articles were popping up about giant fires in Brazil or the fires that are happening out west right now in California and Colorado, just massive, epic fires that are unlike fires we've ever seen. All of these major species are being uh, lost from these fires. And so uh, it's important to be cognizant of these issues when you hear about loss of tropical forest.